basic uh, steps if you see of uh, lab quality is one is first is evaluation of the patient we will not discuss that i'm sure you are aware you have been doing lab qualities so you will be aware how to prepare the patient how to evaluate the patient what investigations to do what are the indications of pre operative mrcp what are the condition in which you will require a pre op ercp which patient to do now which patient to do later when to wait you are aware of all this if you have any question you ask me and we'll finish it if you have any doubt in your mind any question about lab quality evaluation and preparation of the patient ask me because that will not form the part of the main lecture what is the ideal period to wait after quality? idea of ideal period to wait after quality check is checked see lab quality is required for all symptomatic gallstones the symptoms can be biliary colic which is the simplest form and after biliary colic there is no need to wait if today has patient biliary colic you can operate tomorrow the essential prerequisites are that the liver function test should be normal all patients don't require an mrcp mrcp is required if the liver functions are abnormal or you are suspecting uh, cbd stone for any reason or you want to understand more about the anatomy basically if during evaluation you find that the cbd is dilated the liver functions are abnormal particularly sgot sgpt and alkaline phosphate if they are abnormal then you have to find out why they are abnormal the reason may be acute cholecystitis the reason may be a cbd stone the reason may be a merezi syndrome the reason may be liver dysfunction there was liver dysfunction per se the gallbladder can exist gallstone can exist with cirrhosis of liver okay so the liver function may be abnormal because of the cirrhosis so you need to investigate huh background liver disease background liver yeah liver disease which may be known or unknown <coughs> so if the liver function tests are abnormal uh, or it may be acute cholecystitis so you have to differentiate whether there is associated ductal pathology there is associated hepatic pathology or it is infection in the gallbladder that is what you have to differentiate because if there is a cbd stone then you have to extract the cbd stones before lab quality if there is a cirrhosis of liver you have to quantify the liver dysfunction and prognosticate cirrhosis of liver with portal hypertension has very high mortality even for the smallest surgery i mean you touch a patient with cirrhosis of liver you expect 10 to 15% mortality for small things like an umbilical hernia repair in local anesthesia it is not necessarily related to anesthesia it is a cirrhosis per se okay so you have to differentiate whether it is acute cholecystitis or cbd stone so you investigate you find that the gallbladder wall is thickened you find that the sgot sgpt are to the tune of 200 250 300 you find alkaline phosphate is increased there is a gallbladder wall edema the stone is impacted in the neck of the gallbladder and that is causing uh, uh, you know dysfunction then you operate within the first 5 days of acute cholecystitis if you are a high volume biliary surgeon if you are not a high volume biliary surgeon it is best to leave acute cholecystitis for a elective date because the surgery is more difficult it takes longer the conversion rate is higher the hospital stay is higher and the incidence of biliary injury is higher normally in open cholecystectomy the biliary injury rate was supposed to be 1 in 1000 in the era of open cholecystectomy when the laparoscopic surgery came the complication rate the cbd injury rate were reported to be as high as 0.5% to 2% which was at least a 10 fold increase with laparoscopic cholecystectomy now the complicated biliary injury rate of lap coli are settled to around 0.4% which is still four times the open cholecystectomy cbd injury earlier it was said that it's a learning curve and with a learning curve the biliary injury rate will settle down but still open cholecystectomy cbd injury 0.1% lap coli 0.4% this four times higher so the question is is 
severe injury inherent with a laparoscopic cholecystectomy? That is a burning question, which nobody has been able to answer. But you understand that just doing cholecystectomy by laparoscopy, it is inherent that the chances of severe injury will be higher. 40% of surgeons doing lap coli during their lifetime will cause severe injury. 40%. Okay, those are the international figures, actual figures. So you have to understand that so I have caused a severe injury and not once, more than once. Because it also depends on the volume. If I do 60 to 70 lap coli in a month, my annual lap coli rate is somewhere 600 to 700. So you, you, and you are not, don't select your patients. Injuries will occur. Therefore, it is important how to deal with it. So acute cholecystitis, if you are not a high volume surgeon, best thing is to leave it. Treat it conservatively and do an elective cholecystectomy which, when the inflammation has subsided. If you are an expert bilirubin surgeon, you should not operate beyond five days of acute cholecystitis. It all depends on your expertise. Pardon? Any modulations are possible have been attempted to try to bring down the risk for focus on bite in skin use ICG. ICG is very recent. ICG is a is a very uh, exciting uh, addition to the laparoscopic cholecystectomy. A very new, a very exciting, but it has its own limitation, the cost. The camera, you need a different camera, you need a different light source, you need a different telescope. You routinely cannot pick up, but it is becoming, it is a very, very uh, assuring and a very useful tool to locate common bile duct during lapros difficult laparoscopic cholecystectomy. And it's, its use is going to increase. There has been no other breakthrough in identification. ICG has been one. We don't know. When I started my laparoscopic cholecystectomy, the camera used to cost three to four lakhs. And we all were assured that as the, the numbers of volumes increase, and more camera will be formed and there will be more competition, then the cost of the camera will come down. So the camera I was using in the beginning of lab quality was 4 lakhs. Today the camera that I use is 40 lakhs. That was a single chip uh, 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 camera, now this is a digital camera came, that was an analog, analog camera that I was using earlier, analog camera. Then digital, then th 3 chip, then HD, and now we have so many other things, 4K and you know, so both the OTs camera which you see in my OT, one is 4K, one, one is uh, 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 the store's hi highest, uh, they cost 40 lakhs. So cost is something which is very elusive, okay, we all want the cost to come down, but in reality it doesn't. So ICG. All big centers, large volume centers should have an ICG, but those who have smaller nursing homes will continue to have these problems. So your answer is there. Acute cholecystitis, preferably don't operate unless you are forced to. The only time when you are, you should operate acute cholecystitis is in elderly high risk patients. Now this is a very, is a paradoxical situation. High risk patient and elderly patient, you want to operate quickly. Why? Because in these patients, conservative treatment more often fails. They are atherosclerotic, their cystic artery gets thrombosed very fast, they develop gangrene very fast, their omentum is atrophic, it doesn't have fat, so the gallbladder free perforation is common. In an adult, generally omentum is nice, bulky, the gallbladder perforates, it goes and seals it. So extremes of age. Early childhood, when the momentum is not well developed, and extreme of age, when the momentum is atrophic, they have a cardiovascular problem, they have uh, you know severe comorbidities, and if the gallbladder perforates, then the chances of mortality become very high. 
so maybe in a uh, elderly patient if he doesn't quickly settle down within 2 3 days you will need to operate and in these patients you should keep your threshold of conversion very low so does that give you an answer yes. right gallstones cholecystitis yeah not biliary colic biliary colic is not a problem biliary colic you can operate any time today he is it's there you can operate tomorrow i am talking about acute cholecystitis related to stones related to stones acute cholecystitis 99% is related to stones a calculus cholecystitis is extremely uncommon it occurs settings in icu where the patient is very sick the mortality of cholecystectomy is very high and a calculus cholecystitis should be operated quickly otherwise the chances of perforation are very high these are mostly immunocompromised moribund patients you don't wait in a calculus cholecystitis you know you know the sicker the patient the faster you have to operate that's the dictum okay so cholecystitis so that's evaluation position you all know normal supine position uh, patient has a orogastric tube always that's a rule there have been so many occasions when during uh, intubation the anesthetist has inflated air into the stomach and the air is so much that the stomach comes to lie behind them like us and you put a varice needle and your varice needle is in stomach always orogastric tube particularly if your anesthetist has fancies to use a mask laryngeal mask now quite often anesthetists are giving laryngeal mask anesthesia it it pushes more air so you must have a nasogastric tube if the patient is elderly then you have a, a indwelling urinary, urinary catheter otherwise it is not required so tell me how do you create the pneumoperitoneum open, open method right so you always do open method so what is the advantage when you recommend something you must know what are the why are you doing it so tell me why are you doing it under vision will be using that blunt instrument and under vision what are you seeing when you are putting the tocar will be uh, cutting that uh, um, cicatrix there cicatrix right you cut the skin you cut the uh, the cicatrix the, or the sheath we will lift it up and we will pushing it gently sir. right so what are you preventing injury to what vascular vascular uh, what do you do take off the mask very sneed hasan tokar eliminates vascular injuries right because in the when you putting a very sneed or a tokar that first step is a blind step i have injured common iliac artery on the right side right common iliac artery with a very sneed fortunately we realized it quickly and nothing happened and we completed the procedure so the very sneed is a blind procedure you can injure the vessels particularly uh, the major vessels hasan tokar does not prevent visceral injury i mean that is an accepted standard because if the adhesions are there they you will injure the viscera while opening the peritoneum because the viscera are adherent to the peritoneum try to understand that a bowel is free when you put a varice needle and the blunt tip comes forwards if a bowel is not fixed it will move away okay it doesn't come and hits the needle is the needle which goes and hits the bowel only if the bowel is fixed if the bowel is mobile the bowel will move away okay similarly trocar if you are putting the trocar and the bowel is free the bowel will move away because bowel is a very mobile structure when does bowel get uh, uh, injured when it is fixed so when you are taking a trocar it it doesn't move away it gets so if the bowel is fixed to the peritoneum you will injure the bowel while opening the peritoneum it does not prevent bowel injury it eliminates vascular injury and vascular injury 
in laparoscopy is always because of the wrong technique. If you stick to the right technique with a viris needle, you will never injure the great vessels. The dictum is you stay in the midline, you hold the needle as a dart, you hold the needle only as far away from the tip as you anticipate the thickness of the anti abdominal wall. The patient is thin, you hold it closer to the tip. The patient is thick, you hold it farther away. And at the umbilicus, there is no fat. So you are away from the umbilical cicatrix. Remember, there is no fat there. So you hold it close to the tip and stay in the midline. Your tip should stay in the midline. And the tip should be directed towards the hollow of the sacrum. Because at L4, the umbilicus is commonly at L4. There, there is a little lumbar deviation. The, the sacrum comes, lardosis, the sacrum comes anteriorly. So that is the point where the aorta is closest to the skin at, at the level of umbilicus. If you direct your viris needle towards the hollow of the sacrum and the bowel is not adherent, you will never injure great vessels. But yes, in Australia, um, uh, blind entry is prohibited because of medical legal reasons. But it's a very tedious uh, procedure. It's time consuming. It, for, it uh, uh, you know, uh, it takes longer. It causes more injury to the sheath. But yes, people use it. Only to prevent vascular injury. It does not prevent bowel injury. You should remember that. That's what the literature says. Right. So what is the pressure? Pressure will be 15 so not more than 15. 50. And flow? 6 to 10. Right. So uh, and you? Same. I keep my pressure at 50. Flow at 50. Pressure at 12. Okay. And flow at 50. Even if you keep the flow at 50, the very little volume, lumen is so narrow that it will not flow more than 2 liters. So you don't have to waste your time adjusting it twice. Commonly people say, keep flow at 5 to 10. It makes no difference. Because the narrow lumen of the viris needle will not allow, even if you keep the flow at 50, that CO2 flow through viris needle can never be more than 2 liters or 3 liters. That is the maximum. Right? So then you put the viris needle, then you put the trocar. Then, after that, No, no. After you do, you have, you have made the umbilical trocar. Now what will you do? Telescope. Telescope. So which telescope? 30 degree. 30 degree. Right. Zero degree telescope should now be almost obsolete. When we started lab calling, there was no concept of a 30 degree scope. Zero degree we used to do, but then it was realized that the CBD is be hidden behind the duodenum. And that area exactly behind the duodenum is best seen by a 30 degree scope. So 30 degree scope is essential for all laparoscopic surgeries. Right? It's very important to know. You will not use zero degree telescope. Right? Then, yes, always first inspect. Have you caused any injury? Is there any bleeding in blood in the peritoneal cavity? Are there any bowel contents in the peritoneal cavity? Have you insufflated the omentum? Have you insufflated the falciform ligament? You must check everything that your trocar entry has been safe. Otherwise, once you start the section and the ball will start moving, you will not be able to see them further. So, after you made the trocar, put a laparoscope, 30 degree, and do a diagnostic lab. Look at the gallbladder, look at the liver, look at the size of the liver, look at the texture of the liver, the consistency of the liver, okay, any pericholecystic fluid, any bile in the Morrison's pouch or in the subphrenic space which will indicate that a perforation has occurred so that you can record it. So always give two minutes for this diagnostic laparoscopy. Right. Now next, making further ports. Abata. Now this is very important, making ports. You make wrong ports and you are in trouble. Okay? So it is very important in every surgery 
to make ports which are very helpful, which are your patient friendly, which are ergonomically suited for your hand movements and which does not cause visceral injury. So first port is umbilical port. Second port? Huh? Now what is the second port you make always? You make only, you can only make one second port. So pehla kaun sa karoge? Mid-clavicular, okay. We'll go mid-clavicular. One inch lateral to? No, you are saying mid-clavicular port then. Why it has to be one inch lateral to the mid-clavicular point? A mid-clavicular port is a mid-clavicular port. No? No, you say mid-clavicular port is a mid-clavicular port. Why do you want to be lateral to the mid-clavicular line? You hold, you hold the fundus? No. Oh, no, no, no. The mid-clavicular port is not for holding the fundus. Huh? See, second port is always epigastric port. The first port is 10 millimeter in the umbilicus. Second port is epigastric port. Now, it is very important to make all these subsequent ports precisely. So, how will you decide how to make second the epigastric port? Where do we make the epigastric port? Lateral means mephalsiform ligament is a uh, it's a midline structure or a right side structure or a left side structure. Right to the falciform ligament. Okay, so lateral to the falciform and in the craniocaudal axis, where do you put it? How much away from the costal margin? There are two points, no? vertical and horizontal. Horizontally, lateral to the falciform. And vertically, where do you put it? How much far away from the costal margin or the xiphoid bone or whatever is your landmark? I don't know what is your landmark. Two finger breadth away from the xiphoid Now, That is the mistake that people do, you know. And that is the mistake that lends many people into trouble. Remember that when you are putting the epigastric port, your landmarks are not bony landmarks. It has to be minimum 2 cm away from the xiphoid. That is correct. Why? Because if you are close to the xiphoid, you see what happens? That in a normal abdomen, the skin is scaphoid. Now you have created pneumoperitoneum. So the abdominal wall stretches. So this part which was overlying the xiphoid bone happens to come lower down. And if you make the port too close to the xiphoid bone or to the costal margin, and when you deflate, you will realize that this port side scar is over the bone. And any scar which is over the bone causes pain. That is why it should be minimum 2 cm below the costal margin. But that is minimum, that is not ideal. Because if you put it 2 cm below, then you deflate, it will not go over the bone. And a scar over the bone is a very bad kind of a port making. So your port has to be two 1 cm below the edge of the liver. Because sometimes there is hepatomegaly. And if you don't take care of the liver and you put it 2 cm below the costal margin, then your trocar will enter the liver. And when you retract and when you are putting instrument, each time your instrument passes, it will go into the liver and will cause bleeding. So remember, all your subsequent ports, your landmark is inferior surface of the liver. The liver should be in clear. Because if you put your trocar and there is a liver there, you will not be able to dissect. The liver will come on the way. When you hold the fundus and retract the liver laterally, it is only the lateral part of the liver which gets lifted up. The middle part does not get lifted up. It is very far. The segment 4 does not get lifted. You understand what is segment 4? Medial to the gallbladder, right? So second port is always according to the edge of the liver, the inferior margin of the liver. Always keep it below the uh, liver. At least minimum 2, if the liver is small, then you go minimum 2 cm from the xiphoid. Otherwise, you are directed by the inferior edge of the liver. Third port is always anti-axillary port, okay? Mid-clavicular is the last. 
so you are putting uh, third port as anti auxiliary whenever you are making ports in one line the rule is the distal most first because if my telescope is here i have got to make two make, make two ports i make the middle one first this will come in the way of my seeing the distal port if you put the distal port first then your this area is clear understand me always the distal most port first and the nearer post port later on clear so the next uh, third port is anti axillary and the purpose of this anti axillary is retract the fund and then fourth port you make uh, uh, in the mid clavicular line however you will not be able to retract it and both these third and port fourth port are 5 mm ports right so what is the next step हटा दो यार थोड़ा जोर से बोलो गोलबेडर विथ विथ वॉट वॉट काइंड ऑफ ग्रासपर यू विल यूज वॉट काइंड ऑफ ग्रासपर टूथ ग्रासपर दैट इज प्रिसाइजली वॉट यू शुड नॉट डू बिकॉज अ टूथ ग्रासपर विल कॉज परफोरेशन ऑफ द गोल बेडर विथ द बाइल विल लीक द स्टोन्स विल लीक फ्रॉम द फंडस एंड वेन यू आर एक्सट्रैक्टिंग द गोल बेडर यू नो योर सिस्टेड एट एरिया इज ऑन द टॉप funding area is at the bottom so when you squeeze it through a small hole in the parity all your bile all your stone will fall in the peritoneal cavity always use a atraumatic grasper to hold the fundus of the gallbladder always there is no role of tooth grasper except in very thick walled edematous fibrotic gallbladders always an atraumatic right so you hold the fundus of the gallbladder and then what do you do thoda haath hata do yaar mukhe samne se zor se bolo daro mat yahan kuch nahi hone wala so what do you do you hold it and then what are you doing retract where medially laterally downwards upwards where huh tip of which shoulder right shoulder right so see that you retract the fundus towards the right shoulder over the edge of the liver that's very important you don't just push the gallbladder into the liver you push it over the edge of the liver that's very important you have to understand towards the right shoulder so why what is the purpose of this movement you must know why are you doing it what is the purpose of the movement huh you want to tend the cystic duct oh you think holding the fundus and pushing it is going to tend the cystic duct in the normal gall bladder no what is your purpose stretch gall bladder along and it'll open up the purpose of the fundic pressure fundic retraction is to bring the hartmann's pouch away from the duodenum the the retraction of the fundus does not go beyond hartmann's pouch okay so your purpose is that the hartmann's pouch is close to the duodenum there is actually they say there is a collisis to duodenal ligament okay so you retract so that your hartmann's pouch get lifted out of the duodenum so that you can do a safe dissection you can do cautery you can use scissor you can use instrument okay that is the desirable effect of the fundus reduction now what is the undesirable effect of uh, fundus reduction what problem it creates when you flip the fundus over the edge of the liver then it pulls the cystic the cbd in the same direction so normally when cystic duct and cbd are at right angle you put the fundus and what happens the cystic cbd gets tented new peritoneum we discussed okay now you don't understand the anatomy of the calot strangle right and now they don't call it calot strangle they call it hepatocystic triangle why so actually what is this uh, this uh, uh, what is it so you see calot described a triangle during his thesis 
which was formed by below cystic duct, medially common hepatic duct, and superiorly cystic artery. That is a triangle he described during his PG thesis. The content of the triangle was branches of the cystic artery to the cystic duct. They are called Kellogg's artery. And some fat and a lymph node and some nerves. But that is not relevant according to the current literature. What is important is the triangle formed by the cystic duct, correct? CHD, correct? But the upper boundary has been taken to the inferior surface of the liver because that is where and the content now become cystic artery. So now many people say that cannot, why should he be given the credit? It is called as hepatocystic triangle. So you have to know this anatomy. And there is a gland, cystic gland of Lund, which is always overlying the cystic artery, 100%. If that gland is there, it is right on the top of the cystic artery. It's a landmark, the value of which was not recognized in open surgery. Because the gland is so small that in open surgery you could not see it. But now with the magnification provided by the laparoscope, you see the gland more often. So it is emerging as an important landmark during lab cooling. So you should know the variations you know, about in the anatomy. Now, if you go to the um, textbooks, they described lots and lots of variations. But the important variations of the cystic duct are, one is short cystic duct. That cystic duct is absent and it is opening directly into the CHD CBD junction, which is a dangerous situation because this cystic duct can, the stones pass more easily because it is wide and you will not find the tapering of infundibulum into the cystic duct. And uh, during dissection, you can uh, confuse to the, uh, get the anatomy. The second uh, uh, valuable uh, anatomy is long cystic duct. The cystic duct arises from the gallbladder infundibulum, comes down and enters lower down in the CBD. Low insertion. But however low it is, it is never beyond the duodenum. You must know that. It is very important. However low is it, it goes, it never goes beyond the, behind the duodenum. So the structure which is passing behind the duodenum is CBD. That's, if you remember that, you will prevent 50% of your complications in lab cooling. The structure which is passing behind the duodenum is CBD unless proved otherwise. Even a low insertion of cystic duct is never as low to go below the duodenum. You, even if you, I wake you up and say how long the cystic duct goes, you see that it never goes below the duodenum. Third and the most important variation, which we have seen very often is a cystic duct opening either into the high up into the common hepatic duct or the right hepatic duct. That is a very dangerous situation you should realize. You should know that it occurs. If you know, then during your anatomical dissection, you can identify a cystic duct which is going upwards. It is not going horizontally. It is not going downward. It is going upwards, high up into the uh, hepatic duct or into the right hepatic. This is a very dangerous situation because in these situations, once you realize it is going above, you must restrict your dissection. You should not try to go and show the junction of the cystic duct with the CBD. As such, in laparoscopic cholecystectomy, nobody recommends exposing the cystic duct and the CBD. The critical view of safety does not recommend exposing the junction of the cystic duct and the CBD. You only trace the infundibulum. You see it narrowing down into the cystic duct. Stop. Okay. So remember, these all things. You know, I'll I'll show you some some pictures. And fourth is the sectoral duct, right sectoral duct, opening close to the cystic duct into the common hepatic duct. The common hepatic duct here is formed by the left duct and the right anterior sectoral duct. There are two sectors on the right liver. Liver is right lobe, left lobe. Left lobe, you have a medial segment, 
you have a lateral segment. Right lobe, you have an anterior segment, you have a posterior segment because the liver is rotated. Remember, the, on the right side, the liver is rotated posteriorly. So on the right side, there are anterior and posterior sectors. sectors. And on the left side, there are medial and lateral sectors. Then each sector has two lobes. Okay? So quite often, the maximum anomaly is that the right posterior sectoral duct or segment 7 sectoral duct opens low down into the common hepatic duct which is formed only by the right anterior sectoral duct and the left duct. It is a very common anomaly. If you get ERC, MRCP, you will realize that this is a very frequent occurrence and this sectoral duct is only 1 or 2 millimeter and when you are dissecting the calot strangle and you are threading the, the, the CVS recommends you should remove all areolar tissue from the hepatocystic triangle. This 1 or 2 millimeter cyst, uh, sectoral duct can get injured and that will be responsible for the bile leak. So a very important anomaly you must keep in your mind is the sectoral duct opening low down in the hepatic duct close to the cystic duct. You must remember that the possibility occurs. Right hepatic duct draining into the cystic duct. Have you seen this ever? I will show you. Then there are what you used to earlier we used to call ducts of Lushka and now we call them sub vesicle ducts. These are ducts traversing in the gallbladder fossa, bile ducts. Okay. And when you are dissecting deep, lifting the gallbladder from its liver bed, then of necessity they are draining into the gallbladder from liver to the gallbladder bypassing the extra hepatic system. So when you are lifting the gallbladder from the bed, there is no way for you to know. And you will see that when you are dissecting, you will see a bile spot on the liver. And you damage the subvesicle duct or ducts of Lushka. And ducts of Lushka are responsible for 50% of bile leaks of the cholecystectomy. 50%. So that is the significance of duct of Lushka. But now they are more often called as subvesical ducts. This pathological anatomy. We'll come to it later. So that's the port position, right? Here they have shown three five millimeter, but the epigastric is terrible. Mm -hmm. So these are the locations. Okay. That's the ten mm trocar. Those are the trocars in position. That's the gallbladder. You hold the fundus and lift it up. So what is happening is you are bringing the Hartman's pouch up and you are showing the adhesions. Currently you will not see any adhesions because you see only fundus of the gallbladder. So the purpose of this is to bring the Hartman's pouch out of the intestine so that you can do a safe dissection. So after that you do the adhesiolysis carefully and the first step is to demonstrate Hartman's pouch. That's all you need to do in the first. Never go dissect medially. You start from the fundus, go laterally, okay? And first step is you to show the Hartman's pouch. Unless you have seen the Hartman's pouch, you have no business to go medially. Absolutely no business. You go medially and you will cause disaster. First step is Demonstrate the Hartman's pouch because unless you demonstrate the Hartman's pouch, the anatomy remains obscure, covered with fat, covered with adhesions, and you put anything there and it will cause injury. So this is the undesirable effect of cephalic traction. The CBD gets tented. One, two, CBD comes to lie in line with the cystic duct. That is a second undesirable effect. That instead of looking right angle. It looks continuous with the cystic duct. And three, when you are pulling it, the gallbladder gets closer to the liver. And therefore, the calot hyperacid triangle becomes narrow. The hyperacid triangle collapses. So the space available to you for the dissection is compromised. So these are the three undesirable effects of cephalic traction, but you cannot do without it. 
Because unless you do this, if electric traction, your Hartmann's pouch is not going to come anteriorly, and you cannot dissect in, in, in the Hartmann's pouch lying in the middle of the intestine. So therefore, with the mid-clavicular forceps, you hold it and retract laterally. So by putting laterally, what are you doing? You are enlarging the calot space. You are making the cystic duct open at right angles to the CBD. So you are correcting all those anatomical aberrations which were caused by the cystic duct. That is the purpose of mid-clavicular port traction. So it has always been on the lateral direction. Therefore, what he said, make the mid-clavicular port little lateral. And that is why we make the mid-clavicular port in the last. We see the Hartman's pouch. If you are right in the midline, you cannot, you will find it retract laterally. So it's always an advantage to make the mid-clavicular port little lateral. But that you should, then you should put, put three ports, retract the fundus, okay, then see where the Hartman's pouch is, and then put a fourth port. That is why mid-clavicular port is always the last port. And <laughs> not, the, not the first port after telescope, but after the last port. Variable. The gallbladder may be small, the gallbladder may be large, the gallbladder may be contracted, the liver may be large, the liver may be short. There is no fixed position of the infundibulum. Infundibulum can, the size will depend on the location of the liver, the location of the gallbladder. But there are four positions the infundibulum can acquire. We'll discuss that. That is very advanced lab quality. The infundibulum can be 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 9 o'clock. Nobody is going to tell you all this. But depending on their location, if the, it is 12 o'clock, then it is burrowing into the calot triangle. If it is 3 o'clock, then it is covering the common hepatic duct. Okay? If it is 6 o'clock, then your sissy duct is open and clear. Because it is of the 6 o'clock. And if it is 12 o'clock, that is the best position to have. Because uh, 9 o'clock. Because then the, the cystic duct is anterior to the infundibulum and is not obscured by the infundibulum. In 12 o'clock and 3 o'clock, the cystic duct is obscured by the infundibulum. But that is, you know, very, very advanced laparoscopic surgery. So now, you have put your retractors, you have exposed the, uh, exposed the uh, area, hepatocystic area. Now you must know the anatomy. And I must have discussed with you while doing uh, lab colleagues. You must know the significance of Ruvius sulcus. Ruvius sulcus again was described for the first time in 1942, but nobody paid any attention to it. Why? Because in open cholecystectomy, the Ruvius sulcus is not seen. The Ruvius sulcus is posterior to the gallbladder. So when you are looking at the surgeon into the gallbladder, the Ruvius sulcus is hidden. But in laparoscopic cholecystectomy, you are looking at the inferior surface of the liver from the caudal aspect. So the ruvius sulcus is seen. The ruvius sulcus may be open, like in this patient. The ruvius sulcus may be just a fissure, and the ruvius sulcus may just be a scar. There are three ways ruvius sulcus present. The importance is that ruvius sulcus carries the right hepatic portal. It carries the right branch of the portal vein, right hepatic artery, uh, to the uh, artery to the right lobe and the right hepatic duct. So, hepat the sulcus may be close to the gallbladder and may be away from the gallbladder. You can see here it is very safe, but sometimes it is right next to the posterior surface of the gallbladder. And by mistake, you end up in the ruvus sulcus while posterior dissection. You will you'll damage the portal vein. Always once you have all the forts in place, look for ruvius sulcus. And the importance is, as you see now, because it contains the right portal uh, vein, right? It is at the same level as CBD. The level of the ruvius sulcus indicates the horizontal plane of common bile duct or the portal triad. Therefore, if you stay anterior to the ruvius sulcus, it's a happy situation. If you go posterior to the ruvius sulcus, and you go a little medially, you are likely to injure the CBD. So that is what is the significance of. And now, more and more people are talking about ruvius sulcus. Earlier, nobody used to talk about ruvius sulcus because it was not seen in open surgery. And for 
20 years, nobody recognized the significance of Ruiz sentence, but again, it is coming into practice. And then you should know the anatomy of bees safe. I have discussed with you in the surgery. Bees for bile duct. You see on the bile duct, there is a small little tiny vessel. That is characteristic of uh, CBD in contrast to cystic duct. Cystic duct never has vessels on the surface like this. This is characteristic of CBD. So you see this and you know that this is CBD. You can see the CBD is in line with the cystic duct. But this vessel in the cystic duct never has vessels on the surface. <coughs> Size is not a criteria for identifying, differentiating between cystic duct and the CBD. The CBD can be large, dilated because of a stone, okay, because of obstruction. And the cystic duct can be large because of a uh, absent uh, cystic duct, you just see the infundibulum. Size is not the correct criteria for differentiating between cystic duct and CBD. The criteria are, one, CBD has vessels on the surface which cystic duct doesn't have and the CBD is always going posterior to the duodenum. So these are the two best points to identify, differentiate between cystic duct and CBD. That's the Rubius circus to show you in more detail how the branch of the portal vein is going through and hepatic artery is going into the Rubius circus. So that's R for your line. R is for Rubius circus. Four is for segment four, and U is for umbilical fissure. So to make it more elaborate, if you are anterior to the R4 line, R4U line, you are safe. If you are posterior to the R4U line, R4U line is just an extension of Rubius sulcus. Nothing much. But they are important. These, these th things, nobody is going to tell you. Neither be safe or R4U or nobody talks about these things. Because they are the very recent concepts in uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy. So you are safe and you are unsafe. I will leave this. So once you are in place, you do timeout 1. You identify, be safe and you do timeout 1. You demonstrate to your assistant, be safe. Okay? And then you start your dissection. So where do you start the dissection? Posteriorly. So where posteriorly? Exactly where? The entire surface of the gallbladder. Near the infundibulum. Where am I? Am I near the infundibulum or I am below? You see my hook. You start at the top of the fat of the carotid strangle. Starting from fundus is a different technique, which is called as dome down technique. The dome of the gallbladder. bladder. So dome down technique, you start dissecting from above, keep releasing the gallbladder bladder till it comes to the cystic duct and then it is attached to the cystic duct like a polyp on a stock. And then you ligate. In open cholecystectomy also, there were two techniques when we were used to do open cholecystectomy. It was called as fundus first technique and the second was retrograde technique. Retrograde is starting from the cystic duct. Fundus first is leading the fundus first. The problem with the fundus first in the open surgery is that when you start dissecting, there will be some bleeding. You get, you may perforate the gallbladder. You get some bile leak. All this blood and bile leak will come down on the calot strangle and will obscure your vision. You know, when uh, esophageal carcinoma, uh, inoperable, when they, they open up the hole by laser, they, what they do? They don't start ablating the tumor from the laser from top. They go down, dilate it, go down, and then start cutting from down upwards. Otherwise, what will happen? You start cutting from up, lower down, there's obstruction. So all that blood and smoke will get piled up in the lumen of the esophagus and you will not be able to see. So the, this problem with the 
dome down technique or the fundus first technique in open surgery is all the blood, the bile and the smoke, they will come down and will obscure your junction of the cystic duct. That's why it is not preferred. So you start at the infundibulum. Most important thing is you see this is the liver, this is the gallbladder. Here you see along this line the peritoneum is reflected from gallbladder onto the liver. You can see that? You see that? From directly the gallbladder it is going to the liver and you come down here. Here you see that the cystic is separating from the liver and there is fat here. You see this area? Here the cystic is separated, you can see that? This is the post posterior part of the calotis triangle. So you start where the peritoneum is reflected directly from the gallbladder to the liver. You can see the liver on one side, where you can see the gallbladder on the other side. That is absolute safe point. Never go very down. 